On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, is the maritime supply chain improving? We look at the latest earnings call from Maersk that says both yes and no. Please take a moment and go ahead and subscribe to the channel. So CNN story from February 9th, 2022, talks about the fact that Maersk CEO Soren Scow sees more supply chain troubles ahead. So I want to play this clip from him and let him talk about specifically what he's thinking. Higher shipping costs that others have to pay, though. Yeah, sure. Fre freight rates have gone up, uh, uh, which explains a lot of our growth. But we are actually also growing, particularly our land side logistics business, uh, a lot, which is also adding. But but we have, a, a if you will, a perfect storm on shipping markets in the sense that demand has spiked in, in 2000 and. And, and 21, you know, compared to compared to uh, 2020, global demand was up uh, eight eight percent, and but in particular in the US, it was up a lot more than that. At the same time, capacity has been constrained by the bottlenecks that we have seen, uh, and we still see today. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, we have close to 90 ships. Uh, lying, waiting uh, uh, outside Los Angeles and Long Beach to get discharged. They wait for three to four weeks. Just real quick to jump in on what Soren is saying here. We've seen an increase in demand. We've seen the spike go up in what people are ordering in 2021 into 2022. And I would argue the other issue at play here is that normally supply chains can predict and figure out what people are going to order. The problem is you can't do that right now because of COVID. Nobody knows what's the issue that's going to be in demand. What commodities are people going to take? And so people are shipping more cargo across so that it's readily available for dispatch, filling warehouses, filling the ports, creating backlog. He talked about the backlog in the port of LA. When you have anywhere from 70 to 100 ships occupied, you're taking a major shipping line out of service, basically, because the ships are tied up. And understand a ship is, is makes money by moving cargo, by continually moving. If it takes two months to do a round trip, you can get six trips a year out of that vessel. If now it's taking three months, you only get four. And that means you have to either add capacity or raise rates to make up the difference in voyages coming across. And that's what we're seeing right now is, is initially what we saw was basically adding vessels. They shifted vessels from other services from the north-south route, from intra-theater services in Asia, Africa, South America, onto the Trans-Pacific, Trans-European route. But now what they're seeing is they're going to start raising rates because, again, they have to do it because of inflation. So a, a lot of factors going on here. Uh, because we can't get enough labor uh, in the in the port, so the combination of much stronger demand and 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 uh, a lower capacities it has driven up uh, uh, has driven up the the freight rates. And thanks very much for giving us all those details about this. Still, the challenges that remain. Is the supply chain are things improving at all right now? And what kind of year do you think it will be for global supply chains? Well, actually, I, right now, the situation does not appear to get uh, significantly better. We still see this surge of demand. Actually, we've had for quite a number of months now uh, a belief that there's unmet demand out there in the market. So, so the global trade is actually constrained by the shipping capacity that is available. At the same time, we still see this uh, long queue, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, particularly in, in, in Los Angeles, uh, not really, not really moving, uh, you know, very, or only very slowly. So, so uh, our bookings are strong. So he's talking about it still continuing, that it's not getting better, that the issues are, I mean, directly they asked him this. I mean, it, are things getting better? And he basically says, no, it's basically staying the same. Uh, we expect a, a first quarter very similar to the fourth quarter and also expect a quite a strong uh, uh, second quarter this year. So I wish I could say that things are getting better, but right now there's nothing uh, in our numbers to suggest so. Okay, so with things not getting better any faster, is there anything you want businesses to know that they could maybe do to get things to move more smoothly? 
I think we all need to get uh, get more labor. That's that's the thing that can really uh, move the needle. More labor in the ports today in Los Angeles. We operate one, the largest uh, container terminal in Los Angeles, and we're not able to get uh, sufficient labor to operate all the cranes that we have. So it means that. It takes longer to offload the ships and reload them again, and that's that's really what what means that we get the queue. But it's not only at the terminals; it's also in trucking. I, before he gets in the trucking, I just want to go back to that for a second. He, he runs the APM terminal in LA. Uh, APM is a subsidiary of Maersk, or actually of uh, AP Molar. That's the APM, and he's saying he can't get crane operators now. Again, in periods. It takes a long time to train a crane operator. You don't just put somebody into a container crane overnight and start moving the joysticks. That takes time. It takes money. You have to invest in that. The, the reason that he doesn't have labor in the cranes right there is because they didn't invest in that prior to this. Now with the surge coming in, again, <coughs> excuse me, we've been in a surge for over a year. Should have been able to train. And I'm saying there's training facilities to send people to to operate these cranes. I've been in them. He can get people in there. He just has to do it. But again, ports of LA and Long Beach have been really slow in hiring their, what they call casuals. New labor's coming in. They don't want to make them union labor, so they make them these subsets. And that's, a, that's the issue going on with I, ILWU right now and the labor renegotiation that is ongoing that has to be hired out before their contract expires in 30 June. He's going to talk about trucks next. It's in warehousing and so on where... We, we need labor to get back uh, and, and hopefully with with the uh, COVID-19 uh, restriction uh, lifting and, and fewer and fewer people getting seriously ill, that this will also happen in the next uh, few quarters. Right here, you see Mayor sees more supply chain trouble ahead. We know that. This is what he's saying. What bothered me about this story from CNN was this story from Fortune. Maersk shipping crisis will be over in a few months, Maersk CEO says. Now, who am I going to believe, Fortune or CNN? I'd probably more lean toward Fortune just because of track records, but I just heard Soren Skua say those exact words on his CNN briefing. And what that tells me is they're interpreting what he's saying in different ways. And so right now we're seeing that. We are guiding in an environment where we are coming out of a pandemic and we don't have much experience with that, to be honest. So we're saying we expect quite a strong first half of 2022. Then we expect what we call a normalization early in the second half. The question is, what is that normalization? Is he talking about a return back to pre-COVID or not as much surge as we've been seeing here? And I think Fortune misjudges that. He goes on to saying here, we're trying to guide as best as possibly can not to be optimistic or pessimistic. We do not have much visibility to what will happen when people return to work. When bottlenecks open up and a lot of the capacity tied up today in LA and Long Beach get released, how is that going to work? We will have to see. And I think that's the big thing. I don't think that according to Fortune here, he's saying that things are gonna be over in a few months. I think he's saying that around the mid-year, we're going to see things not as crazy as they are now. That's not a return to normal. And if you look at the other stories that are out here, you can see that this is a Greg Miller story. I had cited this in an earlier uh, recap. Supply chain chaos, chaos and port gridlock could drag on into 2023. Market correction forecast repeatedly kicked down the door. Uh, I, this is from Alpha Liner. Alpha Liner is one of the big measurement groups that look at containers. And they, they see this forecast for a market correction have been repeatedly kicked down the road. A growing consensus now suggests that the current supply chain crisis will last at least through 2022. And you can see that in freight rates. You can see that in the vessels arriving off the port of LA and Long Beach. Now we just saw a little bit of a dip there with them coming down. We're down to about 70 something vessels, but that's still an abnormal amount of vessels, especially when you look back here to June of 2021, and we're only talking about 10 to 15 vessels. We're still at the high from October right now. And so that's a big problem. Go on in these stories. And this is the thing I'm getting is you keep looking at these stories. And when you look at the mainstream, they're kind of flipping back and forth, but the shipping news is being really consistent in what they're saying. So here's a Reuters story in G Captain. World's damaged supply chains brace for painful recovery. 
In other words, how do they come back from this? Because of the issues surrounding it, it's going to be important. They're talking here to Kellogg CEO. Uh, I wouldn't think that until 2024, there'll be any kind of return to a normal environment because it's been so dramatically dislocated. I think that's true. I, I don't think we're going to figure out how we're going back to work. How are your kids going to school next year? I don't know. How, how's your business going to operate next year? I don't know. And, and that's the problem. As long as there's doubt, that creates doubts in the shipping market and you have to hedge. And what they're doing is shipping a lot of equipment, a lot of gear, a lot of supplies over now. And that's filling warehouses, filling the ports. Now we're going to come back to how the ports are handling this in a minute. Glimmer of hope has the ship gridlock off ports finally peaked. Flexport chief economist sees reasons and thinks they may be easing off again easing off. We're not talking about it being over, but we're talking about the upward trend leveling off, maybe coming down. But the question is, how far has it come down? Here's that graph we were talking about. You can see that beginning of that dip coming down here with ships going down, but we're still, if this is October, we're talking about this being record levels. Just because we're off the peak doesn't mean it's over by any means. And that's what we're seeing. The global supply chain pressure index, that index that was put out by the, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve, still at high levels. Remember, they, they started to say, well, we see it coming down. Well, yeah, a little bit, but not a lot. But nearly all the major indicators have this at normally high level. Lorianne Larocco, always read Lorianne. Viewpoint, the hard truth about the trade deficit. Flow of containers explains why the U.S., is losing the trade war. Why are there so many empty containers? Let me get my Lego blocks again. Why are there three empty Lego blocks containers for every one loaded Lego block container going out of the United States to Asia? That is the trade deficit. Look at this graph right here and it gives you the best indication for full out and empty out what's going on here you know, with full versus empty outbound. And you can see the trade deficit in full bore for you, you know, back all the way back. And they took this chart all the way back to the mid uh, aughts. And now you see where it's at. That is a telling. Uh, this even more so looking at full in versus empty out. And you can start to see that full uh, export volume comparison, looking at the different ports and where they at. I mean, we're just seeing this, issue of empties and then the ins versus outs, all these graphs kind of indicate to you the growing trade deficit that we have going on. Greg Miller talking over at Freight Waves about the cartel liner competition increase as Trans-Pacific rates spiked. And again, what we're seeing is the entrance of new players into the market. Look at where ships are. Look at the million of TEU capacity that we're seeing on here. The Asia to Europe, the Asia to North America has just peaked higher than before. Where are you getting negative? Intra-Asia, into europe Africa. Those vessels are being pulled off those routes onto the more profitable routes. And principally that Asia, Europe, Asia, North America, there was a study out talking about the fact that reliability is up in these areas. Yeah, it's because there's less ships. And so that means they're getting in and out of the port without a problem. Uh, Greg talks about this, the, the growth of non-alliance shares into the ports. I, it's true, non-alliance shares are at the highest level we've seen, still only about 30%. 70% of that alliance share is still shared by the nine large container companies. We've seen new firms come in, but once normalization begins to happen, once the huge spot rates, those rates you pay short term, last minute to get cargo moved, once those go away, you're going to see a lot of these other liners kind of kind of disappear. And look at how the container liners have been answering this. They have been buying ships and leasing like crazy. MSC, 10% since last year growth. Evergreen, CMA, CGM. Maersk, Guan Hai, HMM, Zim, Yang Min, they are all growing, all growing. And oh, by the way, you know, those are all parts of the alliance. Who's not O-N-E, Costco, but got to be careful about that. There was a lot of tonnage that was coming off lease 
because they were going to shed that tonnage because it was getting old, it was going to be leased. And these other companies paid through the nose to get some ships out from some of these other container companies. So just because you see decreases in here, that's, that's what you want to see is the overall percentage change, which is increasing. Again, here's that story. Mike Scholler over at G-Captain. Maersk reports record earnings for 2021 as supply chain chaos continues for now. But again, we're getting those mixed messages. What are those mixed messages? People are interpreting when Maersk CEO talks about the fact that things are going to be normalizing. He's not talking about coming back down to pre-COVID levels. He's talking about normalization in the chaos that's reigning in the industry right now. And then you have this, this is Greg Miller's story. Shipping giant Maris could rake in $50 billion over just two years. I was on Freight Waves uh, TV yesterday on uh, Freight Waves Now. And I joked about one of the most dangerous things in the world is a sailor with money in his pocket. Maersk is buying logistics firms. They've got money. They're flush with money. How are they going to spend their money? Are they going to buy ships? New propulsion technologies? What are they going to do with it? That's the big question. And we're seeing that happen right now. Go on here. Mayor C sees inflation stoking supply chain crunch easing in second half. Again, that plays into that fortune story earlier. And this is why we're getting that cross mes messages here from the mainstream. Are we seeing a relief or not? This is where we're getting that dichotomy. This story from Lodestar, softening spot rates could mean end for ad hoc carriers. Those carriers, those, those you know, CU lines, those carriers that jumped in on the Trans-Pacific rate, they could be going away because the liner services, the big companies, have got the long-term contracts, which means we may see some of those smaller companies begin to go back to their, their routes they normally operate versus being on the lucrative Trans-Pacific routes. This one from Bloomberg, Port of Los Angeles sees chance to ease ship backlog by summer. Summer, it's February, it's cold outside. Summer, they're talking about. And oh, by the way, you know what happens in the summer? Peak season for cargo because that's when cargo starts coming across for the holidays. If you get in this holiday back, if you haven't cleared this backlog, by the summertime, then we've got a backlog going until this time next year. That's why the Port of LA is saying this. But the problem with the Port of LA is their numbers don't indicate that. Understand, second half of 2021 numbers for Port of LA are lower than they did in the second half of 2021, uh, 2020, excuse me. So LA needs to show positive numbers this January. Their numbers have got to be up. December numbers were 10% below what they did the previous year. Before The month before that was 8%. The month before that was 7% below. They've got to start showing positive numbers or at least comparable numbers, meaning they're moving the same amount of containers in and out of the port. Long Beach had a record month. Long Beach is doing great. They're doing fantastic. I think you're, you're poised to see Long Beach maybe eclipse L.A., as a container terminal, again, that goes back to the LBCT terminal that's automated and moving containers at a pretty fast clip. This story right here, another record month for the Port of Savannah as shipping log jam eases. January was a record month for the Port of Savannah. Go to marine traffic right now. Look at off the coast of Savannah. There's no ships waiting. There's no log jam. That's because ships are moving efficiently in and out of the port. Where do you see log jams? Charleston. New York, New Jersey, Port, uh, uh, LA, Long Beach. Although if you looked at the Marine Exchange's most recent tweet, it says zero ships loitering off LA and Long Beach, which is true. There are zero ships loitering off LA and Long Beach. There are 80 ships loitering off Baja waiting to come in, but they're not off Southern California, which is again, Marine Exchange of Southern California, disingenuous, I'm sorry. But this, the fact that Savannah has been able to do pop-ups They've been able to move containers. They are efficiently moving it. We're seeing growth on the East and Gulf Coast. We may see LA Long Beach losing some of those containers. Now, it's not as easy as shipping, moving a ship from LA Long Beach to Savannah. That doesn't work. You've got to have the infrastructure. You've got to have the facilities. You've got to have the discharge, the warehouses. That's all going to be arranged. And oh, by the way, the cargo has to be going someplace close by. 
you just don't offload in Savannah and then have to rail everything over to LA. That's not what you want to do. Last little bit here to talk about Georgia Port adding capacity has broken the log jam in global logistics. Again, that just goes back to that issue of how Savannah has been able to fix this and really demonstrate what the ports can do. A lot of efforts to the port of Savannah and Georgia ports for what they've been able to do. So when you start hearing stories like, hey, you know, we're turning to normalization, things are getting better, they are improving. Don't get me wrong. They are improving. And it's through the hard work of people like in the port of LA and Long Beach, longshoremen, truckers, drayage, you name it, everybody involved. However, there are still hurdles we have to overcome. And the reason I keep hopping on this is because this is when people get complacent and then we don't invest in the infrastructure and the reforms we need to prevent this from happening again in the future. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please subscribe, hit the bell to be alerted about new videos, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it across social media, and most importantly of all, tune back in for our next episode of What's Going On With Shipping. Until then, Sal, signing off.